Well, it is such a privilege to be here to share God's word with you today. This feels like home to me. It really does. In fact, my son attends this church along with his wife who grew up at this church. Uh, My son's in-laws are here, and they've been here for a long time, Bruce and and Valerie Watlington. And so uh, this feels like home. In fact, Bruce, your, your pastor, is a very good friend of mine. We've been friends for a long time. We have a lot in common. We both love the Word of God, love teaching verse by verse. We both like to cycle. Well, I haven't cycled for a while because I don't like falling down as much as Bruce seems to really like falling down. I don't know what the deal is. Um, uh, I'm six foot seven. Uh, Bruce is not. Uh, So the only reason I mention that is it concerned me about the lectern today. I didn't know if I'd be able to actually see my notes from here, but uh, I can. And one difference between, uh, not only the height is a difference, but Bruce doesn't use notes. I noticed when he preaches, he never refers to his notes. I have to, so I need the lectern. But uh, anyway, it is a privilege to be, and not only just to be here and share God's word with you, but to open up a new series, a series in the book of Acts. It's a wonderful, wonderful book as we uh, get together and share God's word. And the series is called The Spirit-Empowered Life. And today's message is going to be called Convincing Proofs of Power. Now, um, this particular uh, book is all about power. You're going to see that as we go through the book of Acts, as you go through the book of Acts. And uh, let's start with reading the passage together. We're going to look at uh, uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Now, I'm seeing a verse on the screen that's different than what I'm going to read. Is that verse... On this screen? Oh, okay, good. The right verse is on this screen. That's why I was hesitating a little bit. Okay, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Just listen as I read it from the uh, new uh, King James Version. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Lord God, we thank you for your word, and we do pray that today, as we open your word together, that you would teach us what you would have us to know, but Lord, empower us with your word. Help us to go out and be empowered people by your spirit to take what we've learned, and to be witnesses for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, imagine being a disciple of Christ in the first century, and you have entrusted your life to him for three years. And then he's arrested. He's crucified. He has died. He's buried. What do you do? You're afraid. You go and hide. You fear that you may be next. And then suddenly, not too long after he has been buried, he appears alive. And the things that he does leave no doubt in your mind that he has conquered death. But still, even though you're sure that he's had victory over the greatest enemy, you're not too certain you want to reveal yourself that you're associated with this one who has conquered death. But then he says something that really changes everything. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And not too long after that, you do receive that power on the day of Pentecost. And following that time, everything does change. It completely changes for you. You're not the same person anymore. And you and the other disciples go out in the world, and instead of being coward, cowardly, afraid people, you turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. The book of Acts is a book about power. And we see what happens when Jesus' disciples, empowered by God, change the world, fulfilling Christ's great commission. And through the disciples and other early church believers, the book of Acts is a portrait of the spirit-empowered life. And you may be a person 
who was completely changed when you became empowered by the Holy Spirit. Isn't it an awesome thing to look back at your life and see the person that you were before the Holy Spirit came into you and the person you are now? And you realize that that is a miracle of God. The book of Acts is a book of miracles. And a lot of people like to look to the book of Acts as a book of, of sign gifts and miracles and things like that. And it is that. But the real miracle, I think, that we see in the Bible is the miracle of a changed life. And we see a lot of that in the book of Acts. And we live in a world of desperate need of drastic change, don't we? I mean, do we or don't we? The world is dark, and empowered believers can go into that dark world and bring light and bring change. And that's what we hope that this study in the book of Acts will help to do, empower us to bring change to a very dark world. And you see in this book of Acts, you're going to see the, the apostles and other disciples do very great things, and I think we can do even greater things. So that's what I hope we'll be able to do. So today as we begin the book of Acts, we're going to cover three things. This will be the outline for today's uh, study. We're going to look at Acts, get kind of a bird's eye view of the book of Acts, and also we're going to see Luke the sequel. And that's what Acts really is. And Luke... And evidence. Luke is a man of evidence. We'll see that as well. So let's begin with the first of those three points, uh, a look at Acts. Uh, it's always good to do just a traditional introduction when you're opening a book, uh, a look at the book from a, a bird's eye view, as I mentioned, from a 3,000-foot view looking down at the book, looking at the context, looking at the background, and some of the important specifics of the book. And one of those specifics we want to look at is the structure of the book. The book of Acts fits somewhere in the Bible, doesn't it? And there are how many books in the Bible? It's not a trick question. 66 books in the Bible. And there are 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Acts is one of those books in the New Testament. And it fits as a very important part of the New Testament. Now, as you look at the structure of the New Testament, let me teach you something that will help you never to forget the structure of the New Testament and where Acts fits specifically in the structure of the New Testament. As you look at the New Testament, picture it as a house. And one of those houses that is like a nativity scene that you see around Christmas. When you look at nativity scenes, it's a house that has two walls, a roof, and a foundation. And you can see right through it. You can usually just see the baby Jesus in a manger and, and Joseph and Mary and a couple animals. You can see right through it. Two walls, a roof, and a foundation. Picture that. And the roof is four books of the Bible. And it's four books that we call the pastoral epistles. Okay, can you say that? Pastoral epistles. And the reason it's the roof is because it's about the overseers of the church, the pastors. And those books are 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Those four books are books that Paul wrote to pastors. That's the roof of the book when we look at the structure of the New Testament. So that's four of the 27 books. That leaves us 23, if you do the math. Then you've got another wall on this side and another wall on this side. This wall that's to my left, your right, there are nine books. Those books we call the... Epistles to the churches. And that's because Paul wrote those epistles or those letters to the churches. And it's to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, to Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, 1st uh, and 2nd Thessalonians, the epistles to the churches, so we call them epistles to the churches. That's pretty easy to remember. And there's nine of those on this wall. This wall is another nine books. Those are the epistles not to the churches, but general epistles. We call those general because they're not written to churches. They're written uh, to the Hebrews. They're written to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, for example. Uh, they're written to 1st and 2nd Peter. Those kinds of books that aren't written to churches. So there's nine of those, nine of those. What's that add up to? That's 18. So if you have four books up here, 18 here, what's that total? How much? 22, so that leaves how many in the 27 books of the New Testament? So we've got five books left. So now you've got the foundation. How important is a foundation to a house? Jesus said it's very important. You've got to build a house on a good foundation. Without the foundation, as a matter of fact, the New Testament would make absolutely no sense at all. You wouldn't know much. If you read the New Testament without knowing the foundation of the New Testament, it wouldn't make sense to you. So you've got to have the history books 
That's what those five books are. They are the books of history. And those are the, the four Gospels and the book of Acts. And those are the narratives, the stories, the accounts of the New Testament. They tell the life and the work and the ministry of Christ and the life and the work and the ministry of Christ through the disciples of Christ. And that's the book of Acts. It's so key to the New Testament because it carries on the life and the ministry and the work of Jesus through his disciples, which means it's carried on through you and through me. That's how important the book of Acts is. That's why this study is so important. It's the work of the Holy Spirit through you and through me, beginning in the book of Acts. So that's a little bit about the structure of the New Testament. Also important in a look at Luke is the writer. Who is Luke? Well, Luke, the uh, writer, and I'm, I'm careful to say writer because the author is God. God is the author of all the books of the Bible. He wrote it, Luke wrote it down as God inspired him to write it. And Luke was a physician. Luke was a doctor. That's important to know because he was a doctor who was also a missionary. And he was a companion of Paul, which is really a good thing. If you're a, if, if you're a missionary like Paul, you want to have another missionary who's a physician. I, as, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm a missionary now, which I never dreamed I would be, by the way. But I wish sometimes I had a doctor with me on these missionary trips. A lot of doctors become missionaries, but it would be great to have a doctor, a physician with me on some of these trips. Because, you know, sometimes you get sick, sometimes you need health care. And so he, Paul had one of the best physicians with him on his missionary trips. And he even, look at Colossians 4.14, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, sends his greeting to you, and also Demas. So we know that Luke was with him, even in other situations, as we'll see. But did you ever wonder, when you think about Luke as being a physician, did you wonder what, oh, a physician in the first century, what does that mean? Did he have an office? Did he have a stethoscope? Did you make an appointment with him? You go in and, and sit in the lobby, and he calls you in and, and takes your pulse and your blood pressure? You know, what, what did a physician do? Well, let me read this from a commentary. He probably studied to be a physician in Antioch in Syria. In the ancient world, the Egyptians were the most skilled in medicine, having taken centuries to perfect their art. And first century doctors like Luke could perform minor surgery, treat wounds, and administer herbal remedies for everything from indigestion to insomnia. How many of you are familiar with Paul's ministry at all? Do you think he needed a doctor with him on his ministry? Absolutely. So it's a good thing he had Luke with him. And Luke was also a missionary in his own right. In 2 Timothy 4.11, listen to what Paul writes to his young protege. From prison, Paul writes this, only Luke is with me. And get Mark and bring him because he's useful to me also for ministry. So that's a little bit about who Luke is. And by the way, Luke was not one of the original apostles or disciples with Jesus. That's a mistake that some people make. Luke was not one of those. Luke got the message about the gospel from eyewitnesses, and we'll talk more about that. The letter, the book of Acts is, and the, and the gospel, by the way, is addressed to somebody named Theophilus. Theophilus means lover of God or loved by God. Probably a high-ranking official in that time, and uh, a friend of Luke. Luke was probably somebody who was respected in the community, and he and Theophilus had befriended each other. Both the gospel and this book of Acts is addressed to him. The title, Acts. Do you think Luke sat down and said, I am going to write a book called Acts? No, he didn't do that. But the people who translated it, the editors, those who got, gave it to us in its present form, called it the Acts of the Apostles. I think more appropriately, it could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I think it could be called Acts Empowered by God. I've got another name for you that I think is even better coming up. What's the theme of this book? Still looking at an overview of this book of Acts. The theme of the book is the carrying out of Christ's final command to the apostles. What was Christ's final command to the apostles? Well, you can look at the end of Matthew, and it boils down to two words, make disciples. 
Later on in the book of Acts, we see that he said, be my witnesses. And really, the book of Acts is carrying out what Jesus commanded them to do. Really, it's make disciples. That's his great commission. The date of writing, and that might seem like a boring fact, but it's not when it comes to the book of Acts. The book of Acts was written in 60 to 62 A.D., or A.D., 60 to 60, not common era like you're seeing today, trying to expunge God's influence on history, but A.D., 60 to 62. Why is that important? Because Luke interviewed eyewitnesses who were actually there after Jesus was resurrected and spent 40 days and was seen by over 500 witnesses, some of whom Luke actually was able to interview. So that's important. We'll talk more about that too. But Acts might be called also Luke the sequel. Luke the sequel. Acts, in essence, is the sequel of the gospel. Some of you might have seen the sequel to uh, Top Gun, which is big in the theaters right now, and you might think it's even better than the original. Well, I, I would say that, that Acts is essential to the original. It's essential. It's an essential part of the Gospels because it carries on the work of Christ through the believers. Now listen to what he says. As we get into the actual text, now we're going to take a look at verse 1 of what Luke has to say about his own Gospel account. He refers to Theophilus in the first verse. Listen to what he says. Verse 1 of chapter 1 of, the act, of Acts. He says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So Luke, referring back to his gospel, says that Jesus began to do and teach in that gospel. It's not everything Jesus did and taught. It's what he began to do and teach. The verb began in that verse means that Acts continues the account of what Jesus did and taught. And he continues it, as I mentioned, through the body of Christ. That's how his work continues on earth. And he's still working and teaching right now. As I'm teaching up here, he's still working and teaching. Acts is still happening right now. So where did the gospel leave off? This is neat. What... what what uh, Luke says here is really cool because this is where the gospel leaves off. It's important. Before Jesus was taken to heaven is where the gospel leaves off. He says in verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up and after he gave orders, and the way it says it in the New King James, he had given commandments. He's not talking about his commandment to love one another. And that. He's saying he gave the apostles specific orders what was the order that he gave them? After through the Holy Spirit, he gave commandments or orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. What orders had, had he given? Well, that order was given. Those orders were given in the gospel. Not the order he gave in Acts, but he had already given orders before he ascended into heaven. In Luke 24, 49, he said, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Stay in the city of Jerusalem. Tarry there until you are endued with power. There's power again. Until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, until you're endued with power from on high. So that's where Luke picks up. Where Jesus left off in the Gospel of Luke. All that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Warren Wiersbe is a great commentator. And he makes this point, and it's very important for us to realize this. He says, every Christian needs to move out of the Gospels into the Acts. You know, so many people are stuck on the red letters of the Gospels. Even secular people, I'll hear them quoting, you know, Jesus said, love your neighbor. As you. Okay, that's fine. But we need to move out of the Gospels, and here's why. Knowing about the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ is enough for salvation, but not for spirit-empowered service. We must identify ourselves with him as our ascended Lord and allow him to work through us in the world. The church is not simply an organization engaged in religious work. 
It is a divine organism, the body of Christ on earth, through which his life and power must operate. He died for the lost world. We must live to bring that world to Christ. That's why we have the book of Acts. It's the continuation of the work he began. Are you getting how important that is? Good. So we've seen an introduction to Luke. We've seen that Luke is the sequel, and it's important that we have a sequel to the Gospels. And here's the name I think that really should stick with the book of Acts. Just put an F before Acts and call it Facts. Because Luke was a man of facts. I think Luke was a detective. I think he chased down the facts. That's what Luke did. Luke is a supreme historian of all time. Luke was a man of logic and evidence. Being a doctor, a man of science, it was important that he was conveying the truth and what he conveyed made sense to his, to his reader, but ultimately his readers. And to make sense, he wanted proof. He wanted proof beyond all reasonable doubt, both to provide proof for the claims of Christ and to give proof to the skeptics, those who didn't want to believe. And so he gave convincing proofs or infallible proofs. And so in verse 3, he says this, to whom, and he's referring back to the apostles whom he had given orders, he says, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs. Why does Luke highlight that? that he presented himself with many infallible proofs. He had obviously died. They knew he was dead. He had proved himself alive. He doesn't brush over that. He presented infallible proofs. What were the proofs? Jesus was walking. He was talking. He was breathing. He was eating. He presented the holes in his hand, in his side, in his feet. And he didn't just do it as a hallucination or a short vision. He did it for 40 days with over 500 people. Luke wants us to know that. Being seen by them during 40 days, Luke says. Luke was no doubt able to interview many of the eyewitnesses, those over 500, during that time prior to his writing in 60 to 62 A.D., A.D. 60 to 62. And speaking, what was Jesus speaking about? Of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That proves, again, it was Jesus. What else would he speak about? The things of the kingdom of God. Same topic he, he talked about prior to his resurrection. So Luke is a person of evidence. He checked everything out. He didn't repeat rumors. He verified and he introduced, even his gospel, he, he wasn't playing telephone. You ever play that game, telephone? He wasn't doing that. He checked it out for himself. And listen to what he says in the introduction to his gospel. Going back to his gospel, Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. There's other gospels, other people have written things. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. We got this from people who were actually there. This wasn't third hand, fourth hand. It seemed good to me having had perfect understanding. In other words, I investigated everything carefully from the very first to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things. In other words, but you may know the exact truth in which you were instructed. And if you read the stories of Jesus recorded in Luke, you get the sense that he is trying to present the stories as if he was actually there. You get the sense that he was. That's why people mistake Luke for being one of the disciples that was with Jesus, because he presents it as if he were actually there. I believe that Luke, as I said, was probably initially a skeptic and that he had to be shown the evidence himself. I believe he was one who probably said, okay, show me, is there anything left of the grave clothes? I want to see that. 
Any, any parts of the cross left? Can I go into the tomb and check it? Any DNA that I can check? You know, any, any fingerprints? I want to see what I can see. That was Luke. He was a supreme historian. You know, some of these documentaries that you see on the History Channel, on the Discovery Channel, that, that want to talk about who is the real Jesus, and they go back and they talk about Paul, and they talk about the church and the disciples, and they do these documentaries, they will use secular historians to, to back up what they're talking about because they feel comfortable with Josephus or Cornelius Tacitus or these other historians, but they don't feel as comfortable quoting Luke because he's in the Bible. But Luke is far superior as a historian to any of those other secular historians. And his detail and his, his information and the evidence he has to back up what he says is much better than any of that. He is the supreme historian of antiquity that we have to back up what we believe. That is Luke who wrote the book of Acts. One commentator writes this, the word proofs that Luke uses is a word that occurs only here in the New Testament and looks at demonstrable evidence in contrast with evidence only provided by witnesses. In other words, it's stuff that you could see, you could feel, you could touch. The resurrection, he says, was proven by touch, by sight, by feel. Like John said in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That's what people want when they want proof, isn't it? That's by human nature, that's what they want. We've got a couple of grandkids now, Wendy and I, and it's a wonderful thing. I don't know if you have grandkids, but it's a good gig. It really is. You know, our daughter and son-in-law, they just moved to Texas like so many people, and they absconded with our grandkids. <laughs> so we have to do a lot by Zoom. It's not the same when you can't touch them and feel them and hug them and handle You know, it's just not the same. And we know we're reminded by our grandkids that they need that touch and feel and stuff. If you, if you tell them, you know, I bought you a sucker, it's not enough for them just to know you bought them a sucker. What, what do they want? Well, they want to see it. But it's not enough for them just to see it. They want to touch it. They want to handle it. But it's not enough for them just to handle it, is it? They want to taste it. That's human nature. And that's the kind of evidence that John says we have, and that's the kind of evidence that Luke says that we have concerning the proof that we have for Christ. Luke likes detail and hard evidence. Being a physician, being the scientist that he was, and God has not left us without solid evidence. Our faith is not unreasonable. We do not have an unreasonable faith. We don't have to un, uh, abandon reason or rational thought. You know, almost no court decision is made on absolute proof. What kind of proof are they, is a court decision usually made on? It's beyond a reasonable doubt. Wendy and I like to watch those shows like Dateline and 2020 and 48 hours. Why? Because we like to see the evidence followed through to a conclusion where the perpetrator is actually caught and, and faces justice. Now, we hope they go to prison and receive Christ like most of them do, but ultimately, we love to see the detectives do their work. And that's why I like Luke, the detective who does his work. But it's always beyond a reasonable doubt. It's never absolute. And if you're looking as a non-Christian, for absolute proof, you'll never get there. You have to ask yourself, what's keeping me from coming to a decision for Christ? Is it absolute proof? Well, then you'll never get there. But there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the claims of Christianity are true, and you cannot say that about any other faith. And Luke gives that evidence. God has not left us without solid evidence. We have infallible, dependable, convincing proofs. Specifically, we have proof of power. Proof of power. And that's what we as Christians can lean on. That's an exciting thing. We have proof of power. Power to do what? I'll give you some examples. 
The real power of the Holy Spirit can be seen in, as I mentioned before, individual changed lives. And you might be able to relate to some of these. Power over sin. Without the Holy Spirit, you don't have power over sin. You are the victim of sin. You are at the mercy of sin. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You have the power to understand God's word. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But with the Spirit, you have the power to understand God's word. John 14.26, Jesus promised the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you remembrance Bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Power over sin, power to understand God's word. Power over our fears. That's a big one, especially today. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Power to change. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And finally, power to witness, and we see this a lot in the book of Acts. Jesus, I love the story of Jesus sending out the 12, and he warns them, they're going to arrest you, they're going to persecute you, they're going to scourge you, all these things. That didn't happen to the 12 when he sent them out. Not in that story. I believe he was looking ahead to beyond the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what happened in the book of Acts to those disciples later, after they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he said, at that point, to those like us who are empowered by the Holy Spirit, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. I ran across the list of what pe makes people afraid to share their faith. See if you can relate to these, and I'll close with this. They say, I'm afraid I'm, I might do more harm than good. Can you relate to that one? I don't know what to say. I may not be able to give snappy answers to tricky questions. I may seem bigoted. I may invade someone's privacy. I'm afraid I may fail. I'm afraid I might be a hypocrite. Let me ask you one question. What does a witness do? A witness testifies to what they have seen and heard and touched and felt. How can you get that wrong? How can anybody fault you for that? How can you be afraid to share that? Are you operating in fear of the power of the Holy Spirit proven in Christ? We have convincing proofs of power. Are we living like we're convinced? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the power that we have through your Holy Spirit. We not only have the power promised in your word, but we then have the proofs of power that you've given us. We pray that we would put the fear aside and start living like we're convinced of that power. Lord, we saw what the apostles did, what the disciples were able to do when they were convinced of the power that they have through you. May we live in such a way that this world that's in desperate need of change would experience the kind of turning upside down that it did through that initial power of your Holy Spirit that, that they did through the early church. We pray for this lost world, Lord. Help us to bring the change that's needed. In those that you've given us the opportunity to affect, for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.